Thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about how to build a major league skill set and explain like you're not stuck within the constraints of your degree. Uh, I'm going to show you how I leverage Twitter to get a job in Major League Baseball. So I'm going to give you a brief intro and a bio. I'm going to show you the thesis research I did here at Eastern um, and how I got a job in Major League Baseball. I'm going to explain how to market yourself. Uh, I'm going to add, tell you what skills matter. I'm going to show you non-traditional baseball jobs because there's a lot of new ones popping up inside of baseball. And then I'm going to give you resources, okay? Uh, this is the same for pretty much every sport. Like, there's, I can't remember the, the woman's name, but there are people who I've seen on Twitter post their work samples and get hired by the NHL, the NBA. Like, this isn't specific to baseball. It's just my area of expertise, and I understand this one better. So if you want to get hold of me, uh, my name is Robert Riggins, and I am a minor league hitting coach for the San Francisco Giants. Uh, you can follow me on X, or formerly known as Twitter, uh, at Serve Lead Coach. Uh, there's my email. And if you're interested, I do have a website where I post all of my uh, hitting research. I don't post as much now because it's got to stay with the organization that I work with. So my career in New Mexico. So I came to Eastern in 2004 as a pitcher uh, here for the baseball program, and I was also diagnosed with two heart diseases. Uh, so I was not able to play after that. So my existence in the Eastern New Mexico baseball program is probably one inning of a scrimmage in the fall. <laughs> and it did not go very well. Uh, so I graduated in 2008 uh, with my bachelor's in PE and minor in history, and I have not taught a PE class in my entire life. Um, so in between that time, I wanted to be a college coach more than anything. I wanted to, I wanted to be a part of the college game. So I thought if I became a good enough high school baseball coach that I could become a college coach. Um, in that 10 years from 2008 to about 2018, I probably applied for over 50 college jobs and never got a single interview. And so... I kept noticing that most of them required a master's, and so I decided if I got my master's in athletic administration and I did a research topic in baseball, maybe I would be taken more seriously. These are the jobs that I had in New Mexico. So from 2005 to 2009, while I was going to Eastern, I was a freshman pitching coach at Clovis High School. Uh, and then all these head baseball jobs that I had, I was the pitching coach and I would hire someone to be the hitting coach because I didn't know anything about hitting. So I want you to remember that in a little bit because that's going to come back. So my career after my thesis research. In 2020, I was hired by the Milwaukee Brewers. So I started posting my thesis research and my proposal and some of the things I was finding. I remember I was at school teaching a lesson and I see, uh, I get DMs from the Cubs, the Yankees, and the Brewers on my Twitter account asking if I'd be interested in interviewing in jobs. Obviously, we didn't do anything the rest of the day because I was bouncing off the walls. Uh, but I got hired in 2020 by the Milwaukee Brewers because of my thesis paper. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, that paper was that good. Uh, when I get there, I, was, I told you I was a pitching guy. I get there, and they introduce me, and they say, Rob's a... a, a development coach, his job is to handle the data, help the coaches build plans, do whatever else you need, but he's assigned to the hitting staff. And I remember telling my boss at the time, I don't know anything about hitting. And he's like, yeah, you do. You wrote that paper. And so for the last two years now, I have been a hitting coach in professional baseball, and nobody cares what I know about hitting or about pitching. Everything I do is on the hitting side now. COVID hit, and my position got cut, and about halfway through that year, um, I had to become a butcher at United Supermarkets in Amarillo, Texas. So I was at spring training for about 10 days when COVID broke out, and they cut our position. Uh, they were no longer paying for my apartment. I had just convinced my wife to quit her x-ray job and move to spring training with me, um, and we were there for 10 days, and then obviously COVID hit. So it was a very hard experience during that time to go from a dream job to next week you're cutting chicken in the back of a supermarket. 
So that next year I founded uh, my own player development company in Amarillo, Texas. So we do data-driven player development. Um, it still exists to this day. It's a little smaller now because I'm gone eight months out of the year. Uh, in 2021, I got offered a job at Lackawanna College in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, and that was my first college job. I slept on the pitching coach's uh, cot in the spare room and I had a paper route at three o'clock in the morning every day. If you don't know, junior college baseball coaching positions do not pay a lot of money. I started posting some of the work I was doing with the players. And in the fall of 2021, I actually get interviewed with seven different teams about positions because I was still posting some things that I was looking into as far as neuroscience, um, how vision in the brain works when you're trying to make swing decisions. And I was still posting that on my hitting blog. And I guess teams were reading that. And so with all the teams that I spoke to, I actually it was kind of cool. I got to pick which team I wanted to work for. So I chose to work for the Giants because they were the ones that were going to allow me to do the weird things that I was doing. So last year, I was a DSL hitting coach for the San Francisco Giants. This year, I was a Dominican hitting strategist for the San Francisco Giants, so I was in charge of both teams down there. Uh, my Spanish has gotten a lot better. I'm, yeah. Necesito más trabajo, pero está bien. So my thesis research, what I did, oh, and I, I was told that I do have another job next year. They're still waiting to tell me what I'm doing, but... I still currently work for the Giants. Uh, so my thesis research was baseball bat attack angles and their in-game correlations. So the biggest thing that I found was attack angle is the most influential catalyst in batted ball contact and in-game offensive production followed closely by bat speed. So this was due to the attack angle having the largest influence on the center of masses between uh, the bat and baseball contact. So what does that mean? Basically how close the center of masses are lined up to each other, that's how like, efficient the energy transfer is gonna be. And so for years, even when I was in high school, I was taught to swing down and try to put as much backspin on the ball as possible. Well, my thesis completely disproved that entire theory, which was pretty prevalent in Major League Baseball at the time. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I got picked up. I also blame that as the reason why I couldn't hit in high school and I have was <laughs> teamed to be a pitcher. So to give you like a brief overview, like what was my research? So research question one, number one was, what is the ideal batted ball outcome? And the cool thing about Major League Baseball is a lot of their data, they just put openly out on websites if you know how to look for it. So a lot of the data points that I was looking for were publicly available. One of the problems that I had is when I pulled the data I wanted, it was eight and a half million data points, and I tried to run it through Excel. And if you don't know anything about Microsoft Excel, it's not designed to pull more than 40,000. So I would crash my computer every time I tried to run it. And that's one of the, I say the magical part of Twitter is when I would ask for help on how to do these things, there was always somebody in the sports community that would show me how to build that skill out. So I paid a guy $8 an hour to teach me how to learn how to code in R. Um, so the, the next part of it was, if you're trying to get a high batting average, you want line drives at a launch angle of 10 to 15 degrees. And then if you want to try to hit home runs, you want, a bit, you want fly balls 25 to 35 degrees all over 95 miles an hour. So what type of bat ball collision consistently creates that? It's uh, one where the center of the mass of the bat is hitting slightly below the center mass of the baseball. And that's where the big part of you can't swing down and try to hit the top of the ball and create backspin. And I'll have videos I'll show you in a little bit, is the ball doesn't roll up the bat. It compresses against the bat and then bounces off of it. So the path that most consistently creates that ideal batted ball is an uppercut. And I, like I said, my whole life I was told to swing down. And most players at that time we're told to swing down. So here was the clips that I showed you. These aren't mine. Uh, these are actually, I believe they're Rawlings. Um, they do some high speed video testing to test the quality of the bats and the balls. But you can see the ball compresses pretty hard onto the bat. An odd note, uh, I learned this as well. A softball is actually harder than a baseball. 
the coefficient of restitution of a softball is at a higher level than that of a baseball. So these were some uh, qualitative tests that we did. So this camera is called an edgertronic camera. I worked three jobs for, or sorry, four jobs, because I was a teacher, I was a security guard, uh, I was giving lessons on the side, and I was coaching. So I was working those four jobs for 18 months so I could afford to buy this camera, because it's, it's an $8,000 camera. So what you can see is like it is possible to swing down and put backspin on the ball, but like the angle that you have to swing to actually put the backspin on is pretty steep. And most pitches are coming in like negative three to negative 10. So if a pitch is coming in at negative three, negative 10, and you're swinging down, your chance for contact is extremely small. And it was pretty cool that my wife actually helped me do this. Uh, so she was pretty fired up to get to help me with some of my thesis research. She was the one pushing the button, catching, catching the film. So this was like offsets of like, where, where is the center of mass of the bat in relation to the ball and like the type of spin that comes off the bat. So we just tried to test like any theory we saw out there, now that we had a camera that we could physically see how the ball was coming off the bat. And then these were vertical bat angle and spin axis. So like guys that tend to be more flat on their swing, they're gonna to tend to have more of a 12-6 spin. And then as you see more vertical bat angle, you're gonna have more side spin. That's gonna change. So it's point of contact's gonna change it. Um, quality of contact's gonna change it. Um, and then vertical bat angle is gonna change the spin axis. And then all of those things are going to affect how the ball flies. So one of the most prevailing theories at the time was you should try to put as much backspin on the ball as humanly possible. The problem with that is, is the air around the ball becomes unstable at around 2,800 RPMs, so the ball then starts to balloon upward and is no longer going to lift and carry. So 1,800 to 2,800 RPMs is the ideal range for a batted ball for carry distance. And then we did uh, a test on side spin as well. So batted balls typically are going to have two types of spin. They're going to spin forward or backward, and then they'll spin to one side or the other. And these are all things that I was putting on Twitter, and this was pulling the attention of these major league teams. So these were my results uh, from Coach Price's team. Um, D these were data points that I'd put together of all the balls that they had hit when I came here and collected data points from them. Uh, this is where they would have landed on the field based on their attack angles. So the guys that were swinging down, they're not going to have a lot of base hits. The one over here all the way on the left. Guys that had kind of like a zero to four degree attack angle, kind of iffy. And then our, the guys that had more of the uppercut that were five degrees and above, those were going to be the ones that had the best chance for offensive performance. So I gave you kind of a general idea of what I put out on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to show you how to market yourself. So the best thing is to create an X or Twitter account and have a website to showcase your examples. Okay? Because one, like one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they make a Twitter account and then they just regurgitate other things or people that other they regurgitate things that have already been said by other people. That's not what teams are looking for. They're looking for original ideas. Engage with others on social media. Don't troll people. I can't stress that enough. There are a lot of major league executives that have dummy accounts, and they will DM you and ask you questions. And there were a couple executives from teams that had, were DMing me, and I, had, I thought the guys were Joe Schmo. I had no idea who they were. And then they're like, oh, I'm so-and-so. I'm the director of baseball operations for this team. And I've been talking to this guy for like six months and having no idea who he was. So you just never know who you're talking to. Okay, so you're putting a, a pretty public profile out there. Probably one of the best advice, so I went to the Dallas ABCA, I think in 2017, and I talked to Jason Ochart, who at the time uh, was the director of hitting for driveline. Since then, he's been the hitting coordinator for the Philadelphia Phillies, and now he's the director of hitting development and program design for the Boston Red Sox. And I asked him one question, how do I become a college coach? 
And that's what he told me. Create something, put it online, and the right people will read it. And that's exactly what I did. So these were some more kind of weird experiments we put. Um, we had an experiment that we do that, it's, it's just a weird experiment. So if you use white noise or you have per somebody hit with earplugs in, it makes them swing the bat faster. If you put pink noise in, it makes them swing the bat slower. And so these are all of our data points that we're showing. Uh, so you can see like the def rotational acceleration and bat speed over here are like way farther up than all these other ones. We got to the point where I was helping out a summer league high school showcase team. We had kids hitting with AirPods in, pumping white noise during at bats. And that's the kind of stuff we were putting on Twitter. Um, this one, for some reason, was extremely controversial. And this one, I got, I got trolled quite a bit on this one. But I was just putting that you can see as spin rate goes up, like your exit velo is going to go down. Because what happens is there's a trade-off. When you make contact, the energy has to go into exit velo and spin. That's a simplified explanation. So the more spin you have, the less energy is transferred into exit velo and vice versa. If you've ever seen a guy hit a ball and it knuckles off the bat, it's because he perfectly lined up the center of masses and all the energy went into exit velo. Exactly, yes sir. So these were like the kind of work samples that I was putting on Twitter. Because they, like, they didn't want to, like, the whole, try to, yeah, they didn't want to, the they wanted to say, no, you should still be trying to put as much backspin as possible on the ball for carry distance. I guess I'll send you the link with all the comments. And <laughs> it was, it was wild. So uh, one of the things that we do have is a hit tracks machine. So hit tracks uh, shows us like point of contact and then where it would have landed on the field. So that was one of our, our earplug studies is, so if you look at this one, we had a kid uh, that he was, he was getting jammed a lot. So this was like a session that he didn't hit with earplugs in. And then this was a session that he did hit with earplugs in. And so he was starting to catch the ball more out in front. And so we were showing like data samples of guys in different environments. Uh, we got so extreme with our neuroscience stuff that we started doing what we called spotlight hitting. We would turn all the lights off in the entire facility. We would have a spotlight behind the hitter pointed at the pitching machine, and he would have to hit as the ball was entering the beam of light. And the reason why is we read uh, some research that said the best hitters in the world keep their eye on the front of the baseball or slightly in front of it. So our thought was, could we just constrain all the other light in the building and force them to have to look at the front of the baseball? And then we got even weirder with it, and we made him hit with an eye patch on, and we made him put earplugs in. <laughs> and so these guys took like, they hit for 15 minutes, and when we were done, they told us that it felt like they'd just taken the ACT. They said that I don't feel tired physically, but they said that was the most cognitively draining thing I've ever done in my life, because I had to focus so hard. So this was uh, my first attempt at coding in R trying to compare attack angle to bat speed. Um, and I hired Robert Frey. Uh, he's a guy that he does uh, analytics and he can teach you. He also has a, a YouTube channel, he does stuff for free. Uh, but eight bucks an hour, and he's, he's a good dude. So some examples. These are people way smarter than me that I would suggest you follow them on Twitter. Uh, Kyle Bodie's the founder of Driveline. Uh, he's one of the guys that kind of inspired me to do all this and like kind of provided a path of this is possible for somebody who's never played professionally to do. Because typically the way it's worked to professional baseball is if you didn't play, you can't be a coach. Okay, so I've never played past high school, but I'm going into my fourth year and being in professional baseball. So it's, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, it's even changed as much as uh, one of our major league coaches, Alyssa Nacken, is going into, I think, her fourth year. She's one of the first female major league coaches. Um, the New York Yankees, Rachel Balkovec, is a high A manager. Uh, Rachel Folden is a hitting coordinator for the Chicago Cubs. So it's no longer what you did. It's, are you the best person for the job? Uh, Robert Frey, I know I plugged him enough. Um, Brett Hammond is a data scientist. He used to be at Abilene Christian. He now, I think he works for Young Brand Foods, but he also does uh, data analytics for F1 racing. 
and baseball. Uh, and then Denton Sagerman is a director of player development for Indiana baseball. He does a lot of good stuff with pitch data. And a lot of teams are doing this. I was at Oklahoma University three weeks ago shadowing their hitting coach, and they were showing me softball data that they're doing. So the softball is slowly, especially the big programs, they're starting to get into using data and analytics in their game. So if you want to be a hitting coach, this is what I would recommend. Learn Spanish. Okay? You're going to see this pop up a lot. Uh, I would also recommend SQL, R, Google Suite, Microsoft Suite, biomechanics and kinesiology, your basic hitting and pitching physics, basics of human vision, and your basic SNC or strength and conditioning principles. Like these would be the foundation of what you would need to know if you wanted to get a hitting coach job. And then just some technology platforms, Rapsodo, TrackMan, Blast Motion, Hit Tracks, Hawkeye, Kinetrax, and True Media. If you wanted to be a pitching coach, oh sorry, some, some certifications, and I, I provided these, these ones at the bottom, because I know you guys are all college students, these are free. You can get a Blast Motion certification for free, Bird Tech Ground Reaction Force Data in Baseball is free, and Swing Catalyst Ground Reaction Force Level, uh, it's more geared towards golf, but there's, those are all free. Okay, so one of the things I do is I scour the internet and try to find as much free information as I can because I get in trouble by the wife because I spend a lot of money on <laughs> books and certifications. Um, on Base U is really good, Driveline Foundations of Hitting, and Sabre uh, Level 1, 2, and 3 baseball analysts are really good ones to do as well. If you want to be a pitching coach, learn Spanish. <laughs> and why is that? Like... Great question. So, so why is it important to learn Spanish? A big majority of players come from Latin America. Oh, wow. uh, it's, it's a pretty large majority, and so and every team has a complex in the Dominican where they take te kids from Latin America. Uh, we, we had a kid from Ga Uganda that played down there this year. Uh, we saw a couple kids from Japan, but a lot of players, I want to say it's close to 25-30%. I could be wrong, but it's, it's around that speak Spanish. So it's very important. So if you speak Spanish, you've already put yourself over the majority of applicants. Uh, same, same data in SQL, or SQL R, Google Suite, Microsoft Suite, pitching biomechanics, workload management is, is big because now they have these sensors and it's really important to understand acute and chronic workloads with pitchers. Uh, pitch physics is huge. And then technologies know Rapsodo, TrackMan, Hawkeye, Kinetrax, Pulse Elbow Sensors, True Media are all important things to know. Uh, recommended certifications. OnBaseU does pitching as well. And OnBaseU is like, it teaches you like how to, how to test somebody's range of motion, what their body is capable of, and then it gives you a better idea of how to coach that player because you understand why they move the way that they move. If they have pelvic issues, and you're asking them to do a move that they physically can't do, it makes it really frustrating for the kid and for you. Okay, so it just helps you make better coaching decisions. Uh, foundations of pitching with driveline is really good. Same thing with the Sabre analytics uh, classes. Basics of pitch design, and the, it's the same uh, ground reaction force data in baseball. If you wanna be a strength and conditioning coach, learn Spanish. <laughs> Um, our strength and conditioning has become a very big part of, of all professional sports. Um, our strength and conditioning staff is very large. Um, so this was the first one that they recommended was the National Strength and Conditioning Association uh, Certified Strength and Conditioning Coach. So it requires physical therapy or chiropractic medicine. Uh, they also recommended getting USA Weightlifting Level 1 on base U baseball certification, functional range conditioning, and functional movement screens. And I provided links to all of those. That'll take you to the exact website of how to set that up. Non-traditional jobs. These ones I don't know as much about, but they pay a lot better than my job. So <laughs> uh, there's data an analytics. Uh, there's biomechanists. We are expanding our biomechanist department. So you could, you could work inside of uh, a lot of teams have labs now. So that's a possibility for you to do. Sports research and R&D. If you go on these websites I'm gonna show you, a lot of teams are hiring uh, research and development people. Um, nutritionists, we have mental skills coaches now. Um, software engineers, we have a lot of people building out software and data and websites and things for us. Technology and video associate. 
And a lot of them have baseball operations positions. So you could intern at a, at a park, okay? Or you could intern for the Giants, or you could intern, and they can put you in marketing, or they can put you in like front office. You can intern in different positions. So that's what a lot of people are doing. So I'll show you a website that, that has all those positions uh, uh, put as well. So resources, and I provide links to all of them. If you're wanting to just learn more about technology and training philosophies, I'd recommend Baseball Connect. If you want to learn about technology and data, Simple Saber Metrics is a good one. Driveline Baseball is, is one of the best ones. They're kind of at the forefront of using data and technology inside of baseball. Uh, there's another one is Driveline's Open Biomechanics Project. This actually gives you access to biomechanics data and you can actually play around with it. Uh, Baseball Savant is another one where you can actually use in-game data to make visualizations and things like that. Um, and then if you are trying, like right now, I'm trying to learn SQL. Um, so Coursera and DataCamp are really good for those. And then where to find these jobs. These are the two best websites. So Teamwork Online has every, just about every single professional sporting uh, organization represented on its website. And then Baseball Connect is baseball specific. So if you're like, well, I wanna do marketing in the NBA, Teamwork Online would have that, those types of jobs posted, okay? So there are paths to do that stuff. You just have to know where to look. And, and how to get those people's attention. Does that make sense? Yeah, you just, you don't have to be a PE teacher because you have a PE degree. And that's all I got, if you guys have any questions. Uh, can you go back to your uh, first slides where it had the 10 to 15 miles per hour? Uh, does it matter what material the bat is made out of to uh, change those? So say if you had a metal bat, the ball, the baseball, so that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So the, the baseball itself doesn't matter. It still has to travel that fast. But the bat you use could make it easier or more difficult to hit at 95 miles an hour. Yeah, it's going to be easier to hit with a metal bat. Maybe not necessarily now with the BB cores. <laughs> they might have gotten better. Just like wood. Really? <laughs> when, when I played, those things were like nuclear bombs. Like... Those BESR bats, like, <laughs> yes, yeah, the, B, the old BESR bats, those things were ridiculous of how hot that ball came off. Now they've toned it down quite a bit. But yes, the and different types of wood are going to react differently. If you're using birch or maple or ash, um, those are all going to react slightly differently. So great question. I have a question about like when you're talking about marketing yourself. Did you mainly just put out like your research and like, I mean, were you wanting to go into the research side of it when you started marketing yourself or did it just end up coming out to like? Honestly, I just wanted a, a college coach to hire me like that. And then as I was doing all this research, I realized that I really like this. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reason why I love hitting so much is because there's so many more unknowns on the hitting side um, that I, I kind of leaned more into it. Um, so, I mean, kind of like we talked about earlier, you're not, you don't, you pick one career, you're not stuck in that career. I found things later in life that I really enjoyed. So now I don't do anything with pitching. Right. I do everything with hitting. And I would market anything I thought was interesting. If I thought somebody would get value out of it, I just put it on there. There were times that I would just post data. There was times that I would do a full PowerPoint and I would explain why we do what we do at our hitting facility. And I, I mean, I was just kind of like, if I, if I post more, maybe somebody will see it. Yeah. And then I just had another like random question. Did you ever like get a content creator like strategist involved like with your marketing of yourself or did you just post it consistently? I did it all myself. Yeah. I, no, I, I didn't, I just, I just did it. Like if you go back and on my Twitter account and you look at my first posts, they are terrible. <laughs> I, I deleted a lot of them because they were just terrible. <laughs> And it's just with anything. I mean, uh, you know, with Spanish. I was terrible at Spanish, but I forced myself to get out of being uncomfortable mm -hmm. to do it because I knew what I wanted to do. So now, like, my goal is I want to be a major league hitting coach. That's my goal. And then after that, I can say I was the best in the world at what I did. Yeah. And I'm okay just being a dad and a husband after that. 
but everything, now that I know that's what I want, everything else has to be geared towards that. So it doesn't matter how uncomfortable it is. I mean, it's uncomfortable moving to the DR. And so it didn't matter. That's part of what I want to do. So I'm just going to figure it out. What's the most thrilling opportunity you engaged with in this cycle? Research um, A lot of them I can't talk about. Uh, <laughs> I would say the coolest thing uh, that it was is like we read research and we go test it ourselves at our facility, and then like you, I like to, I just like to share things. I like I still love teaching, teaching. and I, I love I love teaching. Like part of the reason why we think the earplugs and white noise works is because when you put white noise in, it raises your your dopamine level slightly. So you're starting the activity with slightly raised dopamine levels, which is going to increase learning. So I would have never thought to look at that 10 years ago. But I also know that me doing that, I feel like we're at the forefront of hitting because nobody else is looking into these things. So I have a question with the white noise. Now come like game day when there's music and chants and all the things going on, do you think that like interferes with what they learned like with the airpods and the white noise or like the yeah <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? that's a great question i don't know that's we're still trying to figure there's a lot of questions that we we find something and then that finds 10 more i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and so the more i think about hitting and the more i think i know the more i realize i don't know um, but i think that being a pitcher for so long and not knowing anything about hitting has served me well because i i have to ask questions because i don't know so, yeah, that's what I love about it is you can always find something else to look into. And like this year, one of the biggest things I learned was what is theoretical is not always practical. <laughs> so those are, that's something, a big, a big lesson that I learned this year uh, working down there. I'll take that in too. <laughs> Do you think your marketing, marketing strategy with marketing yourself can be like applicable to like not only just like baseball or any of that sort, it can be with like any type of thing you want to do after, I guess? I think so. I, I think you really have to figure out like what it is you want to do and where do most of those people do, go on social media. Like for me, I knew that baseball executives and baseball people are more on uh, Twitter. Um, another sport, they might be more on TikTok. Uh, so I just knew that that's why I signed up for Twitter. And I, I'll be honest, I deleted all my other accounts. <laughs> so I don't have Facebook or Instagram or any of those other ones. I just put everything on Twitter now. Tell me if I'm wrong, but you, what you did was you really found a niche, you know, and a lot of times, like traditionally, like you said, college coaching, you have to have like, that experience, maybe that master's, whatever it may be, and what you got really, really good at was something that hardly anyone, like very small percentage, is good at that. Right. Yeah. So that's what I think probably really helped you separate yourself from, you know, it doesn't matter what age, what your background is, if you're a Virginia or anything, you know, you just went around and something. Well, and a lot of it too is like you figure out what the requirements are, and a lot of people eliminate themselves just because they're not willing to do the requirements. Like, I had a coach that was in my position before me, he was in the DR for three years, never learned a word of Spanish. And I knew that me learning Spanish would put me ahead of other people. So I jumped at the chance. I wanted to go down there and, and become fully fluent. And so now I'm hearing that organizations want coaches that know how to do some coding. So I'm going through the pain of trying to learn coding. Like my son likes coding robots. So I'm working with my nine-year-old son to try to learn how to code robots. We're terrible at it right now, but like, yeah, two years from now, we should be somewhat okay. And so, I mean, that's... When he's proficient at it, you come back and say, hey, Dad, I'm hoping when he's proficient at it, he's making a lot more money <laughs> and supplement my lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's what been one of my biggest separators as well, is I've been willing to do things other people weren't willing to do. And, and to me, I'm like, I feel like any Joe Schmo could have done what I did. I just really decided I was going to learn more and just suffer longer than everyone else. Question. Um, what would you, um, how should I say, what advice would you give to 
students that are about to graduate. Just now that you've gone through what you have, some of these students are in that position. What advice would you give them? <laughs> I, you asked me that, and I think back to the, the, the woman who spoke at our graduation who said uh, we were going to hate the first five years after graduation. Uh, <laughs> That wasn't true, by the way. It was, it, was the most, it was the most upsetting graduation speech I'd ever heard. But <laughs> I would say, I, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, is you don't have to do one job for the rest of your life. Like, if you get to the point where you feel like you've reached the pinnacle of that career, it's okay to move on to another thing. I feel like I've learned more now since I've graduated than I ever did while I was in school. And I, for me, I think it's because when you're in school, you're told what to learn. And then when you graduate, you're free, you're more, and you have more time to learn whatever you want. And I feel like that's where a lot of people, like, for lack of a better term, they, they die because they refuse to learn anything. I mean, one of the, I think, saddest statistics I've seen is most Americans don't read a book after they graduate for the rest of their lifetime. I mean... You should never stop learning and growing. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is, is you should learn more after you graduate than you ever did during school. Masters. <laughs>